What is atherosclerosis? I know that almost no one of you is working with atherosclerosis, so I decided to put a couple of slides to introduce how is going on with this disease. So atherosclerosis is a disease of the arteries. So it's something that is uh, uh, accompanying your life uh, throughout decades. Everything starts with an endothelial dysfunction. What is happening is that the endothelial, which is the upper layer of the vessel, is somehow getting damaged, so it becomes uh, dysfunctional. And this uh, helps in attracting uh, immune cells with interacts with the endothelium, and also forces the deposition of lipids within the subendothelial space. In ERs, it happens that cholesterol accumulates in the subendothelial space. And this is what normally we call the generation or formation of a lipid core. What is important uh, is uh, to keep in mind that if cholesterol accumulates within the subendothelial space, you have a reduction in the dimension of the lumen. And in ERs, this end up in increasing the fragility of the plaque as well as increasing the vulnerability. All these uh, uh, different uh, uh, parts of the disease are usually called as uh, the asymptomatic part of atherosclerosis because you cannot really appreciate any major disorder in the patient. What's happened, what could happen at some time in your life is that the plaque gets degraded and ruptured. And if you have a plaque rupture, you expose the material within uh, the uh, atherosclerotic plaque to the bloodstream, and this immediately activates uh, the thrombogenic response. So you have a generation of a thrombus that can either uh, reduce furthermore the lumen or can completely occlude the vessel. And these are known as the manifestation or the clinical events of the atherosclerotic disorders, and are known as you know, angina, myocardial infarction, or stroke. As I mentioned, a key player in this disease is cholesterol. And why cholesterol is important? Because cholesterol accumulates in the arterial wall. And this, first of all, induces the vascular inflammation. By inflammation, we mean that we activate the immune response within the arterial wall. And this, first of all, ends in the uh, recruitment uh, of monocyte subsets and uh, specific T cells within the atherosclerotic plaque. And this is usually driven by the secretion of specific chemokines, first by endothelial cells, and then by the monocytes that are accumulating within the arterial wall. And uh, on a second term, as it happens with all uh, immune disorders, uh, you have the differentiation of naive T cells toward an effector and memory T cell subsets that will furthermore sustain the, the response and will go back to secondary lymphoid organs. What does this mean? This means that if you look closer into the vascular wall uh, uh, or closer into an atherosclerotic lesion, you can distinguish a, uh, what is called a necrotic core, which is essentially the core of the atherosclerotic lesion, which is mainly composed by uh, cholesterol, cholesterol as, uh, which will precipitate as crystals, as well as some cellular debris. But then if you look around this necrotic core, you have a lot of cells. That can be either of vascular origin, so these are smooth muscle cells that from the media are migrating into the intima and they are accumulating throughout all the lesion. But you can also observe the uh, uh, really elevated numbers of cells of immune origins from coming from uh, the bone marrow. And these are mainly monocytes that then get differentiated into macrophages or dendritic cells and then you have also cells of the adaptive response, such as T cells. So the, the idea today is to present, to share with you some of our recent data, uh, going from some aspect of the innate immune response to some aspect of the adaptive immune response. I will talk about pentraxin-3, which is one of the pentraxins. Pentraxins are acute phase proteins, in, which are part of the humoral arm of the innate immune response. And then we will move to uh, T regulatory cells. I will only have a couple of slides about that. And then we will focus the rest of the talk about uh, a subset of uh, uh, T cells, specifically effector memory T cells. So let's start with pentraxins. What are pentraxins? As I mentioned before, pentraxins are acute phase proteins. What does it mean saying acute phase proteins? These are proteins that are increased uh, 
following any type of injury in an acute fashion. If we try to move this into uh, vascular disorders and atherosclerosis, uh, this means that when you have a damage into a vessel, the tissue will either secrete uh, uh, mm, sh mm, molecules such as chemokines, IL-6 is one of those, that will go to the liver, and the liver will immediately secrete short pentraxins. The most famous is the C-reactive protein, CRP. And then you have long pentraxins, such as PTX3, which is directly produced at the tissue level by which cells? Endothelial cells, uh, monocytes, uh, granulocytes are all producing and releasing uh, pentraxin 3. The key point uh, that is uh, under discussion today, and this was under discussion for at least uh, 10 years, is whether the pentraxins are only bystanders, so they are good biomarkers, but they are not doing too much in the disorders, or per se, they could be proterogenic uh, factors that are increased because they have to sustain uh, the atherosclerotic response within the vascular wall. Before going into details of this aspect, let's uh, uh, come with a reminder slide. What is important to keep in mind that the short pentraxins, which are produced by the liver, they mainly are composed by the pentraxin domain, which is here in black. The long pentraxins are mainly produced at the tissue levels at the periphery, and uh, in addition to the pentraxin domain in black, they are bearing an additional domain, which probably will give them additional functions. So let's summarize again what I told you in the previous slide. When you have a tissue injury, you have CRP coming out from the liver, and you have PTX3 coming out from the tissues. They both regulate several aspects of the humoral innate immunity. And among them, I just want to remind you that they favor the activation and recognition of apoptotic cells. They activate both the classical and the alternative complement pathways. And it's under discussion whether they also have some cellular receptors. And more importantly, it has been shown that they can directly affect the structure and the uh, response of the extracellular matrix, including angiogenesis. Why PTX3 could be so important in cardiovascular disorders? Uh, several years ago, it was published that the level, the plasma level of PTX3 are rapidly increased following myocardial infarction. What did the authors was just to compare plasma levels of PTX3 versus the classical uh, acute phase protein, which is CRP, in the plasma of patients that were, that were admitted at the coronary unit following a myocardial infarction. And what they saw was that while PTX3 levels are increasing very rapidly and they reach the peak in few hours following the admission to the coronary unit, uh, there is a different trend for CRP. CRP takes some hours to start increasing and it remains elevated for longer. While if you look at PTX3, you really have a rapid decrease and around 50 hours you are almost at the basal levels before being admitted at the coronary unit. So, there is a different behavior between PTX3 and CRP, given that they both are acute phase proteins. How we can we try to translate this observation into atherosclerosis? Uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, uh, the C-reactive protein that is uh, highly debated uh, nowadays in, in the cardiovascular uh, field, the gene of, C of CRP was not conserved throughout evolution. So this means that CRP is not an acute phase protein in mouse, but is only in humans. And more importantly, uh, people loved to play a little bit with animal models. So they try first to overexpress CRP in uh, uh, animal models of atherosclerosis, but they failed uh, in years to see a major difference. Indeed, why first they uh, suggested that CRP was proterogenic? Then they tried to do the same with a little bit different animal models. So they overexpress human CRP, rabbit CRP on several animal models of atherosclerosis. But finally, they have not confirmed these findings. So overall, there is a big question mark of whether CRP is only a, a cardiovascular bioma biomarker, or, but now it's think that is not true, could be also a proaterogenic factor. 
Fortunately, the opposite is true for PTX3. PTX3 was highly conserved in terms of sequence gene organization and regulation throughout evolution. And this is important from our point of view because it allowed us to use uh, uh, PTX3 knockout animals to try to investigate which is the effect of PTX3 on cardiovascular disorders and specifically on atherosclerosis. One nice work was published a couple of years ago showing that uh, uh, if you uh, investigate the effect of PTX3 deficiency on myocardial infarction, and this is done uh, by uh, performing a coronary, coronary ligation of the coronary artery in the animal model, and then you, you look into the heart, what is going on there. And, don't they, and they observed that uh, if uh, uh, the animals are lacking PTX3, they have a reduced uh, necrotic area into the heart. So somehow suggesting that PTX3 could be protective versus uh, myocardial infarction. And more importantly, the phenotype was reversed when and the exogenous PTX3 was injected in these animals. The other way around, another group played uh, with a different model, which is the restenosis of the uh, carotid artery. And what they did, they overexpressed PTX3 by using an adenovirus, and they compared this model with uh, uh, a control uh, adenovirus overexpressed in LACZ. And what they observed, uh, in the presence of the overexpression of PTX3, they observed a reduction in the restenosis. So again, supporting a protective role for PTX3 in restenosis. Another important aspect is to question which are the factors that are modulating PTX3 expression in uh, uh, cells uh, in the, the context of cardiovascular disorders. And initially, a series of proterogenic pro-inflammatory factors were suggested to induce PTX3 expression, and this is true for IL-1-beta, TNF-alpha, and oxidized LDL. But more recently, also, some anti-atherogenic, anti-inflammatory factors were showed to induce uh, PTX3 expression, and this is true for IL-10 and glucocorticoids. We also published some years ago that also HDL, and um, for those of you that are not working within the uh, atherosclerotic field, you know that we have uh, uh, the cholesterol is distributed among lipoproteins that are called bad cholesterol and is LDL. So when you go back home and you see the blood exams of your parents, uh, they always check, you, you check for total cholesterol and then you have all these strange names, LDL, HDL, and blah, blah, blah. So normally LDL are associated with the bad cholesterol, which is driving cholesterol from the liver to the periphery. So it's entering the arterial wall. And then you have the so-called good cholesterol, which is taking the cholesterol back from the periphery and driving it back to the liver for elimination. So what we observe is that uh, uh, when we incubated endothelial cells with these subclasses uh, of lipoproteins, which is the protective HDL, we increased the levels of the PTX3. And this, I'm not entering in details today, but this is, was due to a specific lipid present on the HDL moiety, which is the sphingosine 1-phosphate, that is activated some specific receptors on the membrane, S1P1, S1P3, and following the classical uh, pathway, PA3 kinase, IKT, this is inducing PTX3. And this could be interesting because uh, uh, PTX3 can then activate the complement 1Q and then increase the uh, phagocytosis of apoptotic cells by macrophages and therefore somehow reducing atherosclerosis. This was at that time an hypothesis. So we decided to investigate further whether PTX3 per se could be atheroprotective or proterogenic. And to do that, uh, uh, I, I have to spend a couple of minutes discussing how you can study atherosclerosis in mice. The point is, is that mice normally are resistant to atherosclerosis. This is, there is only one strain, which is the C57 Black 6 strain, that pushed with a very lipid-rich diet could develop atherosclerosis, but this takes months. So you can, have, you can move the animal on diet, and to appreciate a good atherosclerosis, you have to look after one year, one year and a half of diet. The other way around is if you, if you can get rid of some key genes of the cholesterol pathway within these animals. And in this way, you can uh, increase the levels of cholesterol in the blood of the animals. And therefore, you increase the chance of cholesterol to get uh, deposited within the arterial wall. 
And this was happened when uh, you use animals that are deficient for apolipoprotein protein E. Apolipoprotein protein E is critical for uh, uh, the handling of uh, the LDL toward LDL. If you don't have APOE, you increase the amount of the LDL that deliver cholesterol and triglycerides to the arterial wall. And in other words, you in, uh, increase uh, the uh, progression of atherosclerosis in your animals. So instead of tracking the animals for one year and a half, you have to track the animals for four to six months. That is still a lot, but it's better than one year and a half. So what we did was to cross the APOE knockout with the, uh, the PTX3 deficient animals to generate the double knockout animals. This took a lot of time because uh, PTX3 knockout female animals are not fertile. So we, have, we always had to play through the heterozygote animals to obtain what we did. At the end of the story, we moved uh, after uh, two months of age the animals on a Western type diet, and this is crucial. By Western type diet, we mean that uh, we, uh, rodents usually are not eating too much lipids because it's not part of their uh, evolution. So you push uh, rodents by giving a lot of uh, uh, cholesterol and some triglyceride and fatty acids so you can somehow reproduce the situation that you will observe the, uh, with a normal uh, lipid enriched diet. So what we did was to uh, fed the animals for 16 weeks with a Western type diet. And then at the end of this period, uh, we collected the, the uh, heart of the animals and we looked into the aortic arch. You know that the aorta is coming out from, uh, the, uh, from the heart and then is dividing to, to carotid arteries and then is going back with all the aortic uh, arch and then thoracic aorta and abdominal aorta. So what we did was to look into the aortas for uh, the presence of atherosclerosis, and then we run some gene expression analysis uh, uh, to investigate some potential genes that could be relevant for our findings. Which was the first observation. Uh, these are sections uh, of the aortic root. So you analyze the aorta when it starts from the cuspids, from the heart. And uh, what you normally observe uh, this part is a normal vessel. So what you have here is all atherosclerotic lesions. So you can compare animals lacking only apoe knockout, so our control for the studies, with animals lacking apoe knockout and also PTX3. It's important when working with these animal models that you always keep separated the male and female because nobody knows why, but females are developing larger atherosclerotic lesion compared to males. So you, are, you always have to compare your data according to the gender. Anyhow, in both cases, the double knockout animals presented increased atherosclerosis compared to, anim to control animals only lacking hypoe knockout. What was more interesting is to run specific gene expression analysis by cDNA microarray, and uh, I'm presenting you only the data focusing on the inflammatory pathways. As PTX3 is doing something with the immune response, it would make sense to focus our interest on genes involved in the inflammatory response. And what we observed that double knockout animals presented an increased vascular inflammation compared to APOE knockout animals. And this was true when we checked for a series of chemokines that are critical for this process, CCL2, CCL3, CCL8, IL6, as well as toll-like receptors such as toll-like receptor 2 and toll-like receptor 4. So overall, this suggests up to now that double knockout animals have increased atherosclerosis and have increased vascular inflammation. As you know, you are all working in the lab. You know that uh, you always have to confirm uh, uh, micro cDNA microarray data with qPCR experiments. And what we did was to confirm some of the genes that uh, were observed to be increased uh, in, the, in the previous uh, approach also with qPCR and again, this confirmed that a trend toward an increase in the vascular inflammation in double knockout animals. Obviously, the first question that is, is coming up in all your minds is, okay, that's good. You said uh, we have increased inflammation, we have increased atherosclerosis, which is the reason for this? Obviously, we also asked this, <laughs> and we went through a series of approaches to try to sort out which could be the mechanisms. Uh, I'm not going to all the details today. The key point is that we first try to see whether there are differences in terms of collagen deposition. Collagen is a key protein that is regulating uh, the structure of the extracellular matrix of the vascular wall. 
So if you have less collagen, you, uh, su it suggests that you have a, a plaque that is more prone to rupture. But this was not the case in our animals. Next, we look for the, the distribution of the principal cellular players within the atherosclerotic disorders. So we look for macrophages, smooth muscle, smooth muscle cells, and T lymphocytes. And what we observed is that uh, an increased number of macrophages was present in the atherosclerotic lesion of the, of the double knockout animals. So somehow suggesting that uh, macrophages could be important in the difference, in the phenotypic difference that we observed. So then we moved into investigating some aspects of macrophages, macrophage functions within our animals. However, uh, we tested uh, the macrophages that were isolated from double knockout animals and uh, apo -E knockout animals uh, uh, in terms of response to oxidized LDL or LPS, but they were responding the same way. So this means that macrophages, at least from this point of view, are not responsible for the increased vascular inflammation that we observed. No difference in terms of oxidative stress and no difference when we look for foam cell formation. Uh, you know that one of the characteristics of macrophages within atherosclerosis is that they like to uh, take cholesterol, they phagocyte cholesterol, but then they are not able to handle efficiently this cholesterol. And this means that uh, the cholesterol will then precipitate into the cells and that the cells become foam cells. So overall, no difference over here. So we go back one step and we look for circulating um, leukocytes of subpopulation. And what we observed that there was an, a different balance in terms of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory monocytes. And you know that you can track it by looking into Lysic-C high overexpressing CD11B positive monocytes. But more interested, we looked into the bone marrow of these animals, and the number of bone marrow monocytes in the animals were nicely correlated with the extension of the atherosclerotic lesion. So somehow suggesting that uh, the animals are suffering from a bone marrow monocytosis that then is reflected into an increased macrophage deposition within the atherosclerotic wall and increase in atherosclerosis and increased vascular inflammation. So to summarize, the first part of my talk, uh, we know that myocardial infarction, vascular atherosclerosis, inflammation, or damage is increasing the release of PTX3 in the blood. So it's a good biomarker. But then probably the PTX3 is reducing the heart damage, reducing the heart inflammation, and is also somehow modulating uh, and reducing risk stenosis. If you get rid of PTX3, so in the presence of PTX3 deficiency, what's happened is that you observe an increased atherosclerosis, increased vascular inflammation, and increased macrophage recruitment within the vascular wall. So overall, if you have to keep in mind the take home message for this part of the talk, probably we, this is the idea that you are proposing. You have to look to the increase of acute phase proteins, which is normally observed in many disorders, include, including atherosclerosis, is not an harmful response, but could be a further attempt of protection of our body toward an uh, overactivation of the immune inflammatory response. So let's, let's shift completely from the innate immunity to the adaptive immunity. Why adaptive immunity is crucial? Maybe some of you is working in the immunology field, so you know that it's crucial that we have all the memory response that is keeping in mind what is happening so it will be ready the second time for pushing up the immune response. So if we try to translate this into the atherosclerotic field, uh, when you are into the blood and you have the atherosclerotic lesion, the dendritic cells will look into LDL and modified LDL that are called oxidized LDL, like something not completely self or not self. So you have the classical activation of dendritic cells that are going back to the lymphoid, lympho node. And there will somehow educate naive T cells. Uh, they will present APOB. APOB is the key protein present on uh, lipoproteins. So naive T cells will be educated. Uh, so at the end, they will uh, uh, differentiate or polarize to uh, effector T cells that then can go back into the bloodstream, go back into the atherosclerotic plaque, and support the inflammatory response over there. At the opposite, we have cells that could counteract this effect and are called T regulatory cells. This is important because you know better than me that naive T cells can be polarized to 
several different uh, subsets. The most important are the Th1 cells, which are expressing the transcription factor Tbet and are secreting interferon gamma. You have the Th2 cells, which are expressing the transcription factor Geta3 and are secreting uh, IL4 mainly. Then we have the Th17. We will not talk too much about that today. And then we have the T regulatory cells. The T regulatory cells are considered to be critical because they are somehow controlling uh, all the other, uh, the Th1, and, uh, or they are controlling an over activation of the Th1 and of the Th2 response. Keep in mind that T regulatory cells are characterized by the expression of a specific transcription factors, which is FOXP3, and they are mainly secreting TGF beta and IL10. So our idea was to look into these subsets within our disorders. This is a human aorta. This is a human aorta for, uh, I hope nobody is going to be in a bad shape looking at this one. Anyhow, this is a human aorta. What is critical when you look into human aorta, and this is a patient who died for uh, uh, a stroke at the age of 60 something. You can have area of normal tissue, you can have area of fatty streak, so the initial development of the lesion, and you can have area of what is called the lipofibrotic plaque. When you have, you can see, you have a lot of deposition of lipids within the arterial wall. So what is nice that we can, we were able, in collaboration with uh, uh, a guy from uh, Russia, to isolate these areas and look into this area, how was the distribution of specific markers for uh, immune response. We were expecting a dramatic increase in Th1 and Th2 response and a decrease in T regulatory cells. But this was not true. Actually, uh, we compared uh, from the same tissue, normal areas, which are in blue, fatty streaks in red and lipofibrotic plaque in green. And what you observe that uh, in all cases, uh, if you look into the green bars, markers of all T cells, of T cell subsets are increased. So that's suggesting that uh, uh, the situation is much more complicated than what we expected. So overall, we probably at the tissue level have a balance between uh, pro-atherogenic, pro-inflammatory T cells uh, subsets versus anti-inflammatory or atheroprotective T cell subsets, like, such as T-REC. To further investigate this issue, uh, again, last year, we investigated the different levels uh, of T-reg cells in humans. And for tracking T-reg cells in humans, we selected cells that were CD3 positive, CD4 positive, so T-helper lymphocytes, that were also uh, having an high elevated expression of CD25 and the low expression of CD127. So those cells, which, which are in humans, regulatory T-cells, were not uh, correlated with the extent of atherosclerotic, atherosclerotic disorders in humans. And just to make you an example, these are patients with myocardial infarction, and uh, the T regulatory cell levels were increased compared to controls, while, while everybody would expect a reduction in these cells. So probably, at least in humans, T reg cells are not so relevant as was suggested in animal models. The key point is that in animal models, people played by uh, increasing T-reg cell levels by three, four folds, which will never happen in humans. Even in uh, autoimmune disorders, you normally move from a four, five percent of uh, T-helper cells up to eight, 10, 11 percent, not too much. So I will now move to the last part of my talk, and I will focus on the memory response and the association of uh, memory response within atherosclerotic disorders. As I mentioned before, everything starts with the naive T cells, T helper cells that are called naive because they have not seen the antigen yet. So these cells are not antigen experienced. They are ready to respond to novel antigens uh, that the immune system has not seen yet. When you want to characterize these cells, you have to look into specific, uh, the expression of specific markers. And the most important one is the expression of the CD45 RA receptor and the uh, lacking of uh, the lack of CD45 RO receptor. So they are usually defined as 45 RA positive, 45 RO negative, and also CCR7 positive. CCR7 is crucial for mediating the migration of uh, uh, cells within tissues to the bloodstream and vice versa. So when these cells are educated following the presentation of the antigen by antigen-presenting cells, the first 
differentiate or polarize, use the, the word that you prefer, to T central memory cells. T central memory cells, so are now antigen experienced, they start secreting IL-2, which is a, a chemokine, this is critical to allow the cloning of uh, T cells, and they are higher sensitivity to antigen stimulation compared to naive T cell. In other words, you have the memory cells that are ready to respond to an antigen that uh, you have already seen. What is important, they maintain the expression of CCR7, they lose the expression of 45RA, and they acquire the expression of 45RO. And then we have the other side of the coin, which are the effector memory T cells. They are also antigen experienced, but they have an immediate effector function. So they support the cytotoxic function of CD8, so cytotoxic cells, and they produce a lot of effector cytokines, including interferon gamma and IL-4. Again, they still have, or they acquire the expression of 45RO, but they lose the expression of CCR7. What is important is as they, are, uh, as they have an immediate effector function, they also express several markers that are crucial to have this uh, effector function, such as CCR5, HLIDR, and so on. So if you want to look on the effects of these different subtypes on atherosclerosis, you have to keep in mind that uh, the central memory cells are crucial because they migrate back to lymphoid organs to keep the memory of the antigen that you have seen, while the effector memory cells have a set of antigens that allow them, a set of receptors, sorry, that allow them to migrate directly to inflammatory tissues and to support this response. So the question was, how can we address the role of these cells in humans? Because uh, uh, there are a lot, some studies in animal models, but nobody has really addressed the role of these uh, subsets in uh, cardiovascular disorders in humans. So what we did is to use the cytophorimetic approach. And uh, in the same setting, uh, we used this 10-parameter, 8-color polychromatic uh, flow cytometry. And we were able to, uh, in the same shot, detect uh, 57 different subpopulations. So in the same samples, we mark the, all these, uh, uh, we look for all these markers, and uh, uh, we focus our analysis mainly on uh, central memory cells, TCM, central effector uh, memory cell, TEM, and uh, naive T cells. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, for those of you that are interested and are working with uh, uh, fax analysis, so very easily, uh, we first isolated the T cells three positive, four positive. And among three, uh, T cells, we looked for the expression of 45RA, 45RO. So this allow you to distinguish naive versus memory cells. And within the memory cells, we then looked for CCR7 expression, central memory cells versus effector memory cells. This means that with these uh, seven parameters, we were able to distinguish naive T cells, uh, three positive, four positive, and blah, 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 central memory cells, Keep in mind, RO positive, CCR7 positive, effector memory cells, RO positive, CCR7 negative. Is this uh, approach that we used uh, useful to pick up the effector memory cells and the central memory cells? So we did what should never be done in science. So we self-tested the tetanic vaccination on ourselves, but we were moving to some countries where we need to, to take tetanic vaccination. And so uh, we did uh, blood, our own self blood sampling and we look for the levels of uh, uh, T effector memory cells and T central memory cells. And uh, as expected, uh, you can clearly appreciate uh, by, the, by testing the approach that we uh, set it up that upon two days following the uh, injection of uh, tetanic vaccination, you can observe a rapid increase in the effector memory cells, indicating that the system is working. So then we decided, okay, when we were back from this trip, uh, we decided let's start working with human samples. So we, 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 we work on two different cores. The first cohort uh, was composed by a little bit more than 180 subjects and we were interested in looking into preclinical atherosclerosis. How do we measure preclinical atherosclerosis? You measure preclinical atherosclerosis by ultrasound by looking into uh, the intima media thickness of your carotid artery. So you look how is changing uh, the carotid artery over here by ultrasound. And uh, I don't know whether some of you is expert with uh, uh, echography. Anyhow, I mean, 
when you have the black is where the bloodstream is going. This is the normal vessel, the media from one side, the media from the other side. This area, which is a little bit grayish, gray, is the area where the, le the atherosclerotic lesion is uh, 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 pumping on, so where the atherosclerotic lesion is going to be generated. So by measuring uh, this distance, which is called the intima media thickness, then you can track how atherosclerotic, atherosclerosis is going on in your patients. And what we did was to measure IMT and to uh, check the levels of all this subpopulation and the correlation between IMT, uh, the T cell subsets, and a series of cardiovascular biomarkers. What was important is then when we look for uh, correlations uh, upon age adjustment of uh, IMT with all classical cardiovascular biomarkers, as expected, HDL and the kidney function were highly correlated with IMT. But more importantly, when we looked uh, into the correlation between all the subpopulations that we analyzed of T lymphocytes with IMT, there was a high correlation between the T effector memory cells and the IMT in the court of preclinical subjects that we investigated. Obviously, we did the classical multiple regression analysis to see which is the contribution of effector memory cells on the top of other cardiovascular risk factors. And what, uh, what we observed is that, as expected, age is the most important contributors of uh, uh, the increasing in the IMT and this is expected. But among that, apart from uh, kidney function, which is also very important, the levels of T effector memory cells were highly correlated with the extension of IMT in these patients. So we now know that there is a nice correlation between effector memory cells and the preclinical atherosclerosis. The next question was to investigate whether this is true also with manifest atherosclerosis. So we, we looked into a, a second cohort of patients which we've already had either chronic stable angina, CSA, or acute myocardial infarction. And again, we were able to demonstrate that also in this manifest atherosclerosis, there is an increased uh, levels of T effector memory cells, both in patients with chronic stable angina and in patients with acute myocardial infarction compared to controls. So also in this second cohort, T effector memory cells are key players in the system. But as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, we were not satisfied enough with just looking in T effector memory cells. So we want to look for specific subsets of T effector memory cells. As I mentioned, T effector memory cells acquire specific uh, uh, markers or specific uh, receptors that are crucial for their response. So we were able to distinguish within the effector memory cells and the central memory cells those cells that we are expressing CCR5, so that are named CCR5 positive DEM, HLIDR, which is part of the MHC2 complex, and CX, CX, CR3 positive T effector memory cells. Among all these subsets of T effector memory cells, we looked into the correlation between these subsets and IMT and uh, compared to the all T effector memory cell subset. And what we observed that uh, the most interesting correlation was present with the HLIDR positive T effector memory cells. What does this mean? That looking into T effector memory cells that are also activated, so they are expressing HLIDR, will really suggest an important subpopulation of T lymphocytes which is related to atherosclerotic disorders. And the same was true when we looked into the levels of this subpopulation into patients with stable angina or myocardial infarction. You can see it here. If this is true, can I go back to animal models and see something also there? So we did the same type of analysis. So we took our animals, our model of uh, uh, atherosclerosis, the APOE knockout models, and also a second model, which is the LDR receptor knockout animals, that were fed a Western-type diet. And we looked into the distribution between naive T cells, central memory cells, and the factor memory cells. And what we observed, uh, the worse it goes the disease, uh, uh, the highest are the levels of the TF factor memory cell. So somehow confirming the data, the findings that we had. Uh, in our courts. And more importantly, 
the levels, the percentage of TF factor memory cells were highly correlated with the extension of the atherosclerotic disorders at the aortic sinus of these animals. So we have the data in humans, we have the data in animal models. Uh, uh, another key point of this work was that we observed uh, a nice correlation between plasma cholesterol levels and TF factor memory cells. So somehow suggesting that maybe TF factor memory cells can drive the activation of, uh, or vice versa, cholesterol levels are driving the activation of TF factor memory cells. Uh, to try to investigate di this further in humans, uh, uh, we were able to contact few patients with uh, uh, rare disorders, which is called familiar hypercholesterolemia. So they have a disorder which is resulting in uh, really elevated uh, uh, plasma cholesterol levels. Usually, if not treated, these patients are having a myocardial infarction at young age, your age, 30, 25, 35. And uh, uh, we look into these patients uh, uh, if a trend for uh, uh, TF factor memory cells could be observed, and indeed we found that TF factor memory cells were elevated in FH patients compared to controls. We then wanted to investigate what is changing in the TF factor memory cells of these patients. So we sorted, so we isolated the TF factor memory cells from controls and from FH patients, and we did the gene expression analysis focusing on the markers of the uh, T lymphocytes polarization. And overall, uh, uh, we observed that uh, markers of the TH17 response were increased in FH patients compared to controls. So this is somehow suggesting that uh, uh, the TF factor memory population in these patients maybe is going toward a TH17 polarization, supporting the uh, development of the disorders. So, if you want to summarize the last part of my talk, what we observed uh, focusing on the role of TF factor memory cells is that TF factor memory cells are associated with preclinical atherosclerosis, and we observed a nice correlation with IMT. The TF factor memory cells and the subsets of uh, HLRDR positive T cells are associated with uh, uh, myocardial infarction and chronic stable angina. And this is true also for the subsets of HLIDR positive TF factor memory cells. And when we look into animal models, uh, such as LDR receptor knockout, APOE knockout, we observe an increased percentage of TF factor memory cells compared to controls. And the TF factor memory cells from uh, patients with, fam with rare dis uh, genetic disorders, which is familiar hypercholesterolemia, they are displaying a TH17 commitment. So we can conclude that probably a sustained response to an, an endogenous antigen that could be LDL cholesterol or the proteins associated with LDL cholesterol such as ApoB epitopes will support uh, the expansion of TF factor memory cells. The TF factor memory cells can then go back to the uh, vasculature and uh, further uh, support the vascular inflammation this will probably establish a cycle that will lead again to cytokine secretion and to re the recruitment of new cells, new monocytes, new macrophages within the atherosclerotic world. And this is crucial when we will move the inflammatory response within the atherosclerotic wall that at the beginning is considered to be protective toward an extensive chronic inflammatory uh, response that will be associated with the uh, chronic uh, uh, atherosclerotic uh, inflammation. And I will end in time, I think, uh, thanking all of you again for your attention. And obviously, I will thank all people that work with us on this group. Uh, all people, I'm sharing my time uh, between the Department of Pharmacological Sciences in Milan and the Center for the Study of Atherosclerosis in Bassini Hospital, close to Milan. And uh, the work of Pentaxin 3 was uh, done in collaboration with Alberto Mantovani and Cecilia Garlanda from the Humanitas. And uh, the, the work on uh, the effect of memory is the result of a collaboration with Enrico Mirati and Alessio Palini from the San Rafael Hospital. And again, thank you all of you.